glad you're here today to worship the Lord on this uh, second Sunday of August as we begin to look towards the fall, uh, thinking about uh, that cool weather that's on its way and, and the, the beautifulness that is Colorado in that time. But until then, we're going to prepare our hearts to continue to worship the Lord. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, beginning next week, uh, we will, um, after worship, we go back to our Bible study, uh, our Discover Bible Study series. Uh, learning to be disciples of Jesus, and so that will start next Sunday following morning worship. Um, I, I put it at approximately 10.30 to set a time for that. Uh, that depends on when we get done with worship and also get done talking. And so uh, that will be next Sunday, August the 16th. Also, something that's new in your bulletin, it, it says congregational care. Uh, we always recognize the church is not a building, it's not a location, it is the body of Christ as we reach out to one another. And so on the back of your bulletin, uh, at the bottom where you see sometimes we have other churches that we pray for, uh, you'll see at the top says Congregational Care, has three names. Uh, the Arts, Belisa Bassett, and Diana Birch um, will be the ones that this week. But what I encourage you to do, send them a card, um, give them a phone call, an email. If you want to visit them, that's, that's fine. Just call ahead make sure it's okay with the other person. Make sure they're, they're fine with that and whatever arrangements they need to make. Uh, and then, of course, pray for them lift them up in prayer uh, as you go. So that'll be new. It'll be in there every week. We'll rotate through the church directory. If you don't have a church directory, there are some on the back uh, table uh, by the windows. Um, if uh, if you don't, if we, if we run out of those, let me know, and we will replace those and replenish those. So I'd encourage you to, again, just as part of the body, to care for one another. Uh, there's a lot of one another passages in Scripture, and so this is one of the ways that we can carry those out. Um, also, the women's book study is taking place, and so I would encourage you to take note of that. There's a, a 10 o'clock prayer meeting on Fridays under the tent on South Townsend. Uh, that's part of Prayer Fest and the gathering there. One thing that took place yesterday, uh, we know school is going to start in some form or fashion. We're not sure what. We're not sure they know what. Uh, but we do know that we want to pray for them. So yesterday, uh, about 20, 25 people uh, in about four or five different cars uh, traveled to every school in Montrose and Olathe and prayed for every school. The administrators, if we knew people in that school or knew someone connected there, we prayed for them. And so I would encourage you to do that, to pray for our educators, pray for parents. Um, every educator and every parent has to make a decision that not everybody will be happy with. No one's going to be happy with that decision. It doesn't matter what you do. So the best thing you can do is love people and pray for them, encourage them, uh, let them know. I, I know that was a tough decision, but I'll be praying for you. And, and just encourage everyone that's there. And of course, we pray that God's presence would be in our schools, that God's presence would be uh, connected through, uh, as I prayed yesterday, for every, every student and every staff member that's a believer in Jesus, that they would be salt and light in the midst of that school and that education system. So... We definitely want to pray for them. Of course, homeschool is starting as well. Um, now some of us are veterans of that and past that. <laughs> and we, we've kind of done that. It's, it's, it's past, but we're thankful for that as well. And pray for educators there uh, because they don't have a whole different. Even though they're doing what they probably have always done, they will have new opportunities and options. And so pray that God will be in the midst of that. Again, just at the bottom of our reminders regarding um, the things we do here at the church, we, we write them down, the signs are there, so I don't, don't need to. We just, we, we request you wear a mask. That's just helpful. Um, and conversation with some of our people who just really are, are anxious about returning to worship. And one of the things that makes them anxious is just the percentage of people within our body that don't wear a mask. And so it just, it's not, it's not just you, it's helped other people to feel comfortable as well. So just a reminder uh, in regard to that. Other things are also listed on your bulletin. I encourage you to read the rest of it. Uh, be aware of the prayer requests and things that are there. We gather in the presence of the living God. We gather to worship <coughs> Jesus. And as we worship Jesus, we want to tune our hearts upward to him and just be in his presence that we worship today. So I invite our worship team to come. We'll prepare our hearts as we prepare to worship. Let's stand together and invite Jesus to be in our presence. Heavenly Father, we ask that Jesus be present among us today. We invite him to come and speak to our hearts and to speak to our lives. We invite our king to come and demonstrate his love in our lives. Lord Jesus, today, invite you, the living God, reveal yourself. 
brought into our hearts and lives in Jesus' name.
here this morning and as we uh, pray to those on the back of your um, bulletins, there is a number of requests. Again, we thank the Lord for God's hand uh, regarding Josh and, and his accident. We need to pray for him. Uh, one of the things that we uh, will be doing and adjusting during this time is just a reminder, uh, we are uh, recording uh, on Sunday morning and we'll post that recording uh, afterwards on our website and it will be uh, uploaded to YouTube and Facebook uh, also on our website. And so as we do that, we are working through the processes of how we share this information. Uh, because normally on a Sunday morning we gather in this building and um, we, we pray and we share together. And But when it goes up online, uh, there's anybody uh, could view that. And we don't want it to be that. We want the gospel to go out. We want people to hear God's word. But it does mean that when this information is here. So, so Dave, would you do me a favor? Just mute the microphones across the front for a second. And then we're going to go ahead and do our prayer time. Not that I have heard. Um, Lori's parents are doing well. They get fatigued easily, but they've, they've passed the other symptoms and the, the fever and all that stuff, so they're recovering. They just fatigue easily.
loss of an 11 year old child, uh, it's just a very difficult time. So we can pray for them uh, as well today. The others that are listed here as well, uh, let's uh, sing together as we uh, prepare our hearts. Again, if you want to bring a need to the altar, the altar is open. Uh, if there's any there can be a group like this that can bring a need to the altar.
pray that they would continue to uh, faith in you. I pray that you would continue to, to keep them safe in their spiritual relationship with you. Lord Jesus, I pray. Might they know today of your love and of your grace and of your mercy and the authority of your justice. And I pray that, Lord, you would interact in their lives. And, Lord, as the case goes forward, that the, the things in it, Lord, I pray that you would work in the midst of it today. Lord, we, we just live in a time that is so tumultuous and difficult. Lord, there is, is turmoil, whether it be political turmoil or social turmoil. It, it's all around us. And Lord, we're impacted every single day. Lord, I pray that you would help us know that in the midst of this, we have your peace. Jesus said that in this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. My peace I give you. The world can't give us peace. But we have a peace that Jesus gives that surpasses all understanding. So Lord, fill us with your peace. Hold us steady in the midst of the storm. And Lord, in no matter what takes place, we pray, Jesus, that you'd help us keep our eyes upon you. Now, Lord, for these other requests, we lift them to you as well. We pray that uh, you'd be a full Emily. We thank you, Lord, for being with her and for Lila. We thank you for being in her life today. So many needs. And yet, Lord, you are everywhere. You, you are not diminished. You are 100% you in every single need and affected today. Now, Lord, bless us. Lift us into your presence. Teach us by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. This time now we'll invite our uh, ushers to come, and uh, they're going to receive this morning's tithes and offering. Uh, again, uh, they will be carrying the plates around, so you don't have to pass it, you don't have to touch it, you just need to drop your uh, offering plate. Or off, you don't have to drop an offering plate, uh, please don't drop your offering plate, I understand. Um, but just, you can drop your offering into the plate, and uh, it will be sufficiently taken care of from that point. And so again, we thank you for your faithfulness uh, in your giving. Father, you are always faithful. You always care. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And we thank you for that. And we pray you bless this offering. Bless those who give as they worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
And the New Testament reading is out of Romans chapter 10, 8 through 15. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Sergeant John Ordway, who was there, said the mountains continue as far 
far as our eyes could extend, they extend much farther than we expected. Such terrible mountains I have never seen. Life had changed for the Corps of Discovery. They were going to have to do it differently than what they had planned to do. Well, how does that affect, affect us? Well, we have a pandemic that we've never seen before. We have seen our society altered in many ways that we never expected. We have watched our world literally be changed upside down. And somehow or another, we have to complete the mission of making Christ-like disciples in the nations in the midst of a world that doesn't look the way that it used to look. God has called us to a mission. So that's what I want to talk to us a little bit about today. And starting next week, we're going to begin a new series that talks about living as disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's going to be what we're going to be talking about over several weeks following next Sunday as we move down this road. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? So today I want to start with the first thing. It's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We're going to be in a couple of different passages of Scripture, so I'll put them on the screen so that you won't have to look them up, although I encourage you if you have your Bibles to follow the first point I want to make to us this morning is this. We've been given a mission to complete. Just like Lewis and Clark were given a mission to complete, to traverse across that, that nation and to, to map it out and to give back to the reports of Jefferson, we've also been given a mission. Here's our mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That's why we're here. That's why the church exists. It exists to make disciples of people. To help people come to know Christ as their Savior. And then to begin to learn to live like Him. Uh, to act like Him. To, inc to incorporate into their lives who Jesus is. Luke describes this vision, or Jesus does in Luke 19, 9. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. On numerous occasions, Jesus reminds his disciples that that is the goal, the goal and the purpose of the church. In fact, one time he was sitting with some, some Pharisees who had invited him to come and eat. And they were sitting there, and, and there were some tax collectors and sinners also there. And so finally, one of the Pharisees asked the disciple, uh, why, does your, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, on hearing this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus is teaching us that to be a disciple of Jesus Christ means that we need to intentionally engage with people who don't know him. And we need to intentionally engage with people whose lives look different than us, whose lives are, are, are racked with the scars of sin, whose lives have been pulled off into other directions. It, it, we need to engage with them for the purpose of helping them come to faith in Christ and then to grow as disciples of Jesus. Jesus had a conversation with a woman at the well just outside Samaria, a little town of Sychar. And, and he was there, and he had this conversation with her. And that's a, that's a whole other sermon, so I'm not going to go to that for the sermon, or you get to the price of one. But at the end of his sermon, his disciples come back. And they come back, and they've gone into town to get something to eat. It's kind of like they were traveling along the road, and well, let's go to McDonald's and get some food and bring it back to Jesus. You know, they, they were kind of thinking along that terms. And, and so they come back to Jesus, and they find him talking to a Samaritan woman, which amazed them at that point. But then they get him alone after that, and they say to him, Master, eat something. You know, that's what they'd gone to town for. They'd gone to town to get food. They brought it back to Jesus. And he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Did, did, do, are we second in line now? Did we go get food and somebody else brought an order? He says, No. My, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Do you, don't you have a saying, it is still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So I want to ask you a question this morning. When was the last time that you got carried away with the mission of God and forgot to eat? When was the last time that you were so engaged in what 
what God was calling you to do, to carry the gospel of Jesus to someone else, that your meal took second place, or that your schedule took second place, that your, you, the activities around you kind of got pushed to the side because you were engaging with somebody else for the sake of bringing them to Jesus Christ or nurturing them in the faith. You see, I think sometimes it's real easy to say, well, I can't talk to people about Jesus because I don't have time. Or I can't talk to people about Jesus because I've got this schedule to keep, or I've got this thing to do, or I've got something else to carry out. I can't do the mission because I don't have time for the main mission of Christ. Now, I don't say that to, to, to shame you this morning. Um, there's times when I've forgotten to eat. You can ask my family. I'm one of those weirdos that sometimes gets busy and forgets to eat. Uh, it's just the way I do it. But there's also been times when I've allowed my schedule to divert me from what was the main purpose. There's, you know, I had my to-do list and things that had to be done, and I was checking them off and running down the list, and, and, and there were other things that maybe should have been done, but they weren't because I had my list to do, and I could not get my list done. We have a mission to complete, and that mission is engaging people that don't know Christ Helping them to see how much Jesus loves them. Helping them to see how much Jesus cares about them. Helping them to understand the power and the grace of God that can enter into their lives and transform their lives and help them to come to know Christ as we've come to know Christ. For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior and continue to need a Savior every single day to lead us and help us and to walk with us in the world. We all need that. And so does our neighbors. And so do our unsaved friends. And so do our unsaved family members. So does everyone out there in the world that doesn't know Christ. They need to know the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And God has called us to do it. That's the good news. The bad news is, well, I guess it's bad news, good news. We need God's help to carry out the mission. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, you can't do it without God's help. You can't carry out God's mission without the help of God. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do most things. Oh, wait a second. I misread that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That means that if we want to do anything of, of eternal value, it's going to require the help of Jesus. It's going to require the work of the Holy Spirit to help us do what God has asked us to do. We can't do it on our own. We can't argue people into the kingdom. We can't shame people into the kingdom. We can't scare people into the kingdom. They all need the Spirit of God to transform their hearts, and they need to hear the message, but they also need to sense the presence of Jesus. Jesus needs to reveal himself to them. As he has revealed himself to us. That's one of the lessons that I've learned. Is that, that I can preach all the good words I want to. And I can do all the things I'm supposed to do. To invite people to church. And to invite people into the kingdom. But until the spirit of God comes into their lives. And reveals himself. And convicts them. And draws them. And pulls them. And I'll talk more about that later in my message today. Until the spirit of God does his work. We are simply speaking to the world. We are simply working ourselves to death if Jesus is not doing what he needs to do. Jesus says in this parable that if we are connected to the vine, we're going to bear fruit. If we are disconnected from the vine, we're going to be dried up and withered and burned. Let me continue that passage from John 15. Let me pick it up in verse 6. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Notice here that Jesus puts this request of asking whatever you wish in terms of producing fruit in the kingdom. We are so easy to say to ourselves, well, you know, how come Jesus didn't answer my prayer? Why didn't he give me what I wanted? Why didn't he give me a Corvette? I mean, you know, 
we ask, what do we want? You know, now I prefer a Mustang. I'm sorry, I'll take a Mustang. But uh, we want to think that this ask whatever you wish has to do with my needs and what I want and what I want to do. But Jesus puts this in terms of bearing fruit for the kingdom. And so when we're asking whatever we wish, we're asking God to give us by the help of the Holy Spirit what we need to do the mission. What we need to carry out the work of God. To, to reach our friends and our neighbors for Christ. So that's what he's saying. If you're connected to me, you can ask for whatever you need to do the work of the mission. And because you're connected to me, then I will do it. So that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to me, my disciples. The purpose of the branch is to produce fruit. The purpose of the branch is to, to be as, as we look out at our back patio and the, and, the, and the tomatoes and the pepper plants and those things that are out there, uh, we, we look for fruit on them. You know, we, we don't like to see withered up tomatoes. We like to see plants that are producing fruit. John 15, 4, no branch can produce fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Without the essential connection to Jesus, we dry up. And we wither. Now, again, I want to ask you a question. How connected are you to the vine? How, how connected are you to the life-giving life that Jesus gives through our connection with him? Again, remember we said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So, so it doesn't matter how hard I work. It doesn't matter how many people I talk to. It, it doesn't matter what kind of stuff I do out here. If I'm not connected to Jesus, I'm not going to produce the fruit that Jesus wants to produce in me. Whether it be the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, general self-control, or whether it be the fruit of people coming to a saving and, and, walk, and discipling relationship with Him, whatever that fruit is that Jesus wants to produce in us, if I'm not connected to the vine, I'm not going to produce it. In fact, the fruit is literally going to dry up. I've, I've seen that happen on plants where, where the branch got disconnected. When the branch got disconnected, the leaves started drying up, and the stuff that was on there started falling off because they were no longer connected to the vine. But if we're going to complete the mission, we're going to have to be connected to Jesus. So let me ask you another question today. How's your connection with Jesus? How regularly do you talk with him? How, how often do you connect with him? And I'm not talking about checking off number of Bible chapters. I mean, I, I love, love to read God's word, but it's not about doing things. It's about connecting with him. Sometimes when I'm in devotions and I'm reading the word, sometimes I, I can read four, five, six, seven chapters. I mean, I read several chapters a day uh, in my hour with the Lord ahead of time. Sometimes you get four verses in and Jesus says, stop a second. Here's the spot. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's talk about this thing. One of my friends is getting ready to take a sabbatical. And on that sabbatical, he says the Lord had conversation with him about two things. And I won't say what they are because I don't want to embarrass him at that point or anything. But he says, the Lord just said, here's two things. He says, not that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. Not that my walk with God was not current. But he says, I want to stretch you in two specific areas. While you're on your sabbatical, I want to stretch you and encourage you. And I want to build this into your life over the time that you're taking off. Jesus doesn't want us just to come and punch in our time of devotions. He wants to really talk to us. He wants to, to share, reveal himself in his word. He wants to reveal himself in our prayer time. He wants to spend time with us, not just doing religious things. How's your relationship? How's your connection to the vine? And that brings me to my third point this morning. And that is we receive God's help through prayer. We receive God's help to carry out the mission through spending time with him and spending time in prayer. Acts 1.8 says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We need the help of God. To do what God has asked us to do. Now specifically today, I'm talking about reaching out into the world and carrying out the mission. And it doesn't matter what God has asked you to do. If God has asked you to change a habit in your life, you need the help of God to do it. 
If God has asked you to add something new into your life, you need the help of God to do it. If, if God is, 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 is reshaping you, molding you, making you a different person, you can't do it with willpower. You can't do it with a get up and do it. It is the work of God in us by the Holy Spirit of God that changes us. And the sooner we become aware of that, the sooner we're willing to be humble and say, I can't do it. I need Jesus. The quicker God can do his work in us, whatever that might be, whatever he's trying to do, the quicker we can become humble and moldable lumps of clay in the hand of Jesus, the quicker God can shape us into the image of Jesus. If we think it's up to us, then we're going to find that we aren't enough. Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, it says, While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what they did. When Jesus ascended up to heaven into the clouds and they no longer could see him anymore, they returned back to Jerusalem. And it says there in Jerusalem, they all went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And it lists their names, Peter, John, James, Andrew, the whole group. It says, and they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. That upper room, that location where they gathered, became the heart and soul of Christianity. It became the heart of what the church was doing and what God was going to do through this kind of ragtag group of people that Jesus had gathered together. He said, they began to pray. And then when Peter and John were arrested, you remember that? They were, this, this, this beggar was outside the gate and they said, silver or gold have I none, but what we have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ to rise and walk. And when they did that, the Sanhedrin wasn't happy and they arrested them. So it says on their release, they went back to their own people, reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And then there was another occasion where, where Herod got involved, and he was thought it was really excited. So he executed one of the disciples, and he thought, well, oh, the, the, the people like that, so I'm going to execute Peter. So he arrested Peter, put Peter in prison. But it says in Acts 12, 5, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And so while he was in prison, the church was praying. And you know the story. The chains came off, the doors opened, he walked past the guards, he walked out the gate, and before he knew it, he's outside the prison. And it's like, wait a second, that's not supposed to happen. But what did he do? He went back to the upper room, and he knocked on the door. And so he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. What's my point here today? My point is that nothing happens of spiritual value unless we're willing to invest our lives and time in prayer. Unless we're willing to, to hold people up and pray for them and intercede for them and lay ourselves out on their behalf, that's when things are changed in people's lives. So I'm going to ask a question today. This time the question is not for you, this is for all of us. How should we pray? I want to share four things this morning I think that are helpful for us to pray about. Because sometimes we pray for the answer instead of praying for God to do what's going to bring the answer. The first one's this. Pray the Father will draw people to Jesus. Pray the Father will draw people to Jesus. John 6, 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. We as Nazarenes believe in what we call for rainy grace, the grace that goes before. In other words, we believe that when somebody else out there is not saved, that God's already working. He's already in their lives, he's already in their heart, he's already drawing them to himself, he's already doing things to help them come into relationship with him, and he's preparing them to hear our witness. We need to pray that God would draw them. When I was a young man, before I ever came to know anything about Jesus, Jesus had a really weird path for me. Number one, I was born in eastern Colorado in a little town called Elbert. There's not much out there. Maybe a hundred people, if that. Then we moved to this little town called Kyle. 
which had a few more people, maybe 200 people lived there. But there was a little tiny Nazarene church in Kiowa, Colorado. I knew nothing about the Church of the Nazarene. I knew nothing about church except for when my mom would get tired of us and send us to Bible school. She could be free for a little bit. She'd have these, these kind of rapscallions over here in Bible school so she could rest. Well, there was a pastor in Kiowa that felt like we needed to go to church. And so he would come out, and this is before uh, the days of Blanche Bird. So some of you know Blanche Bird. This is before she went to Kiowa. Um, they came out and they'd pick us up and they'd bring us to church. And I remember standing on the platform from a Christmas program and Kim and I went a while back and visited that church and sure enough, it looked just like it did uh, when I was a kid. Um, but that was point number one, that God began to work on me. We moved to Missouri. When we got to Missouri, we still weren't going to church. We went to a Baptist church in Missouri and in that Baptist church in Missouri, my dad was told, uh, or was my dad was told there was a guy that came to church in that Baptist church and he wasn't wearing dress clothes. And the usher said, next time you come, you might want to dress up. My dad heard that and didn't ever go back to that church. Never came again. And so we were out there and we didn't go to church anywhere until finally one time there was a singing group that was connected to the Nazarene church. Uh, at least the, the pianist who I, I went to see her when she was 100 years old. Uh, and some people sang in that church and my brother was in it. And so my dad and mom said, we're going to go hear your brother sing. I could care less, but anyway, we went. And we went to that church, and we got acquainted. And in that church, I was acquainted with some friends of mine that went to high school with me. And eventually, through Phil Roach, who's now district superintendent, he and Jocelyn helped me to find Jesus Christ in a youth camp. I became a savior. And what I met the savior and became a Christian. All of that was a little road that God was working in this life of people who didn't know God, didn't know Jesus, had no connection to Christ, but he was already working. So that when the witness came, I heard the gospel. I had been drawn to him. We need to pray that people are drawn to Jesus. There's people out there we look at and say, there is no way in the world they're ever going to get saved. I mean, they are so tough and messed up and all the things that we can say about that. There's no way they're going to get saved. Well, we've seen some of them get saved here in our church. They work through the ranch and, and those kind of processes. But we know God can save people, even the worst of people. But we need to pray that God would draw them to himself. It's not our wisdom. It's not our way of doing it. It is the Spirit of God that draws people to Jesus. Second one here is we need to bind the strong man. Now, now this is an interesting conference. It's probably a little more... Uh, assembly thought maybe than what we're used to but it's one of those things that says how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house now I hereby commission you Christian pirates okay you're a Christian pirate your job is to plunder hell your job is to steal back from the devil everything he's stolen from God so we give you permission to go do that we need to, to be engaged in the battle, rescuing from the devil's kingdom those people that need to come into Jesus' kingdom. And we do that spiritually. Ephesians 6, verses 12, 13. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. We are in a spiritual battle. We are doing battle with the enemy. Our, our battle is not people. You've heard me say this a number of times. Our enemy is not people. Our enemy is not a politician. Our enemy is not some other person out here that's doing something else. Our enemy is the devil, and the devil is working in the lives of people. So what we need to do is ask God to transform them, and we can take them away from the enemy. But to do that, the scripture says we have to bind the strong man. We have to, to ask God to hold his influence back so that the Spirit of God can draw these people out. Some people are caught up in some tremendous addictions. Some people are caught up in, in, in tremendous relationships that keep them from coming to Christ. 
I, I talked to people, well, I would, I would be, I'd be a follower of Jesus, but if it wasn't for my wife, or it wasn't for my husband. I'd be a follower of Jesus if it wasn't for this or that. That thing has a hold on them. I mean, to pray that God would bind the strong man so that we might be able to bring the power of God into this person's life. And that brings me to my next point. We need to pray for God to tear down strongholds in people's minds. You see, I'm convinced that most everybody believes that the way they are acting is the way they ought to act. They're not out here saying, well, I shouldn't do this. They're out here living just the way they, they, they believe that that's the right way to live. And they've been taken captive of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, if you want to be in on my prayer life, that's part of my prayer life right there. If my brain starts wandering off where it shouldn't go, I ask Jesus to take that thought captive and bring it back. Because I don't want my thoughts to be on things that are not what Christ wants me to think about. I want my thoughts to be on what Jesus wants me to think about. And so I ask him to take that thought captive. So what's a stronghold? This is my, my, my definition of it. A stronghold is a mindset that impregnates people with hopelessness. It causes them to accept seemingly unchangeable situations that are contrary to the will of God. In other words, they have become convinced in their mind that they cannot change. They become convinced in their minds that there's nothing that they can do or anybody can do to make them different. The good news is there is someone who can, and that's Jesus. That Jesus can break the power of sin. He can break the grip of sin on people's lives. He can change people from what they used to be to what he's called them to be. He has the power. But we need to pray that people will know and believe that there's hope. That there's hope of change. That there's hope of a different life. There's hope of being a different person. Not because somehow we are better, but because God's power can change our minds. He can change the way we think. Now, it's not on your screen, but it's one of my favorite verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When God changes our minds, when he transforms how we think, we begin to live differently, we begin to act differently, we begin to look for different things. God makes us different people. So we need to pray that God would tear down the strongholds in people's minds, the things that have taken them captive, so that Jesus can set them free. And that brings me to my last point this morning. We need to pray that God will open people's eyes so they can choose life. That he'll open people's eyes so they'll choose life. Acts 26. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This scripture was said to the Apostle Paul when he was told, when he was standing before the, the rulers and was being pulled up in the course, he said, this is what I've been called to do. This is where I'm sending you. Later on, when he was talking to Agrippa, Paul said, and I've been, I've been faithful to that vision. I've been faithful to that vision. Like Paul's scales or the blinders that ancient farmers put on their horses to keep them from being spooked, Satan seeks to deceive people to keep them from recognizing that Jesus has already redeemed them. He's already won the battle on the cross. He's already made provision for their sin. He's already given us the Holy Spirit to help us become different people. But Satan blinds people say, I can't ever change. I'll always be this way. I, I, I can't change my life. I can't change the way I think. I can't change the way I talk. I can't change the way I live. I'm just always, I'm just bound to this. You don't have to be. God can change you and set you free. And God can set your neighbors free. God can set the people around you free. He can if the power of God is working in their lives. Our prayer is that they might have the eyes to see what God has done for them. That they may have the eyes to see what God has done for them. When Jesus established the church, they owned his mission. And that mission was to make Christ-like disciples. 
And they sought the help of God by prayer that the Holy Spirit would fill them so they might carry out the mission. Circumstances change. Obstacles arise. Viruses show up. But Jesus has determined that the church will prevail against the gates of hell. John, Matthew 16, 18. I tell you, you're Peter, and on his, this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. God has given us a mission. He's called us to make Christ-like disciples of the people that are around us. He said, you can't do it on your own, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will help you, and you'll be able to make Christ-like disciples just as I've called you to do. And here's the last thing I want you to remember. It may take some time. On January the 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the Emancipation Proclamation. On that day, he proclaimed by executive order that all people, all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are, hence, are and henceforth shall be free. He said every slave in the Confederacy free with that proclamation. January 1, 1863. It wasn't until June 19, 1865, when 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas, and let the slaves in Texas know that they were free. June 19, 1865, from the proclamation of January 1, 1863. It took that time for the armies of the Union to fight their way through, to proclaim freedom for the slaves. And they, they announced that more than 250,000 black people in the state of Texas were free. African Americans celebrate that date as Juneteenth. It's a very important holiday to them because that was when the, they, the finally the last place was said, this is when you're free. Well, there's one more thing. On April 8, 1864, the House of Representatives passed the 13th Amendment, and sent it on to Abraham Lincoln's death. Lincoln signed it on February 1st, 1865, and was ratified on December 6th of 1865. At that point in time, not only was it an executive order, but it was enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. No longer should anyone be a slave. June 1st, 1863 to December 6th, 1865. Three years. And like the Corps of Discovery, they left and came back in three years. Jesus died on the cross. And when he did, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom, and we had entrance to the living God. We could be in the presence of God to seek his help and his grace to help in our time of need. On the third day, Jesus rose from the tomb. And on that day, he forever defeated death, hell, and the grave. No longer did it have any power over us. The world is no longer the same because Jesus died and Jesus rose. Therefore, every person can be free. Every person can know the forgiveness of their sins. Every person can know the transformation of their life. Every person can receive the Spirit of God for a life to be different. Every person you know, whether they look good on the outside or not, whether their lives are messed up or not, they have been freed by Jesus. The question is, have they heard the message and have they known the Savior? You see, that's the question. That's our job. Our job is to take the message of the gospel of Jesus to people that don't know. The church has always been outward and forward looking. It's always from here to Jesus. Always from here to those that are lost. Always from here to those that are around. That is the call of the church of Jesus Christ. And he's looking you and me in the eye this morning. He's asking you, are you willing to be a part of my mission? Are you willing to engage with me to save a lost and dying world? and help them to find Jesus. It begins on our knees with prayer. It begins with our hearts calling out to God, not just for our needs, but for their needs, for their, their concerns. Like I said, we spent two plus hours, two and a half hours yesterday around every school in Montrose, and we prayed for them, for the teachers, for the 
the staff, for the students. We pray for every one of them. In two weeks, we're going to go to the firehouse, the police station, the sheriff's office, and we're going to pray for them. We're going to ask God to move in their lives and help them with the struggles that they have. We, every, every Friday, there's an opportunity for prayer. Beginning the first Wednesday night of September, we're going to begin by having prayer here in our sanctuary. We're going to start by watching the film War Room, and then we're going to do a boot camp on prayer, and then we're going to spend Wednesday nights praying that God would change and transform people. Because that's why we're here. Amen. We're not here to fill a room. We're not here to, to enjoy one another's company. Now, there's a lot of fun being together, engaged in mission, following Jesus. But we're here to save souls. We're here to bring people to Christ and help them to grow into mature disciples of Jesus. And as we do that, God will empower us and fill us with his spirit so that his will can be accomplished, not just in our lives, but in the lives of the people that are around us. Let's stand together and pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, show us your mission. Show us your world. Help us, Lord, this morning to, to know and understand why we're here. It's so easy, Lord, to become just like others, to be deceived, to have blinders on, to think that the world simply revolves around me and my needs and the things that I want. Lord, help us to see the needs of others, to consider others' needs as more important than our own, and help us to be about your mission, so that, Lord, people can be set free and their chains can be gone. Lord, show us today who it is that we are to pray for. For, Lord, salvation is not a group thing. It's an individual life. Lord, I believe this morning that you've called us to pray for people by name and by circumstance so that, Lord, we are praying specifically for you to work in the lives of those whom you love and whom you love. Lord, we pray that today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a closing song this morning. It's only sung several times. It says, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And as we sing this song this morning, maybe this morning you need to pray. Maybe you need to talk about Jesus have heaven do recognize that there is not hopelessness in your life. You can be a different person because of what Jesus does. But maybe today you're not praying about yourself. Maybe you're praying for somebody else. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a family member. I don't know who it might be, but you just want to bring their needs to Jesus and lay them on the altar and say, God, would you draw them to yourself? Would you bind the strong man? Would you release them from the bondage? Would you Help them to have eyes to see that they can be a different person because of your love and your grace. Whatever it might be, the altar is open and welcome to come. Let's sing together as we sing of God's amazing grace. <laughs>
we pray are forever yours. I want to pray today that you would send us forth as your disciples. Send us into your world that you love. Draw to yourself people who do not know you, who have not yet understood or seen that you can love them and that you can save them. And Lord, I pray that you would redeem them with the blood of Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, you set them free by the power of your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, send us out. May there be fruit for our labor. And may your kingdom be glorified now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Next week we'll begin our new series, Becoming Disciples of Jesus. We look forward to it. God bless you.